Oh, well, thank you. Um, thanks, Lucy. So the the little test you've just been doing, we've, uh, I don't know if anybody has done this before. Um, it, it really, the, the reason I do it uh, is I'll, I'll repeat it through the entire, uh, the event or the, the workshop just to, to come back and try and try and have a look at what happens to it uh, during the workshop. Now, the, what this, this workshops, uh, it's built around data-driven design, but what I, what I really, it's not for data scientists. So if anybody on the call is a data scientist, you, you, might, you might not learn very much from it, but at the same time, it might give an interesting perspective. Um, the reason for that is that my background, uh, I come from doing, I'm an electrical technician and I come from doing control systems. So a lot of that is dealt around uh, dynamic systems. Um, and when you're dealing with, with data and dealing with actually kind of using data to either design things or, or to try and understand what you're looking at, uh, being able to understand the difference where you're seeing dynamics and not, I think is, is kind of pivotal in this process. And, and it, and it gives you a good approach to actually understand what, how to uh, how to think about the data that you're using uh, and be able to kind of derive better outcomes from it. Um, the let's see then. So during this, I'll be I'll be doing a few. I've split it up into kind of three main pieces. Is kind of the the why of how you the why you do this. So I want to look at. This goes back to kind of the, the proposition that you have, like the, the actual value you're trying to divide. So you need to have a, a proper purpose for using the data that you want to collect. Um, and you also need to identify what the outcome is you want to have from that data. The, uh, this will also identify the type of analysis that you're using. Now, as I said, kind of, I'm, I'm not a data scientist. So when you're doing something with data in this in this field it's like i think it's really important to bring somebody in who is a data scientist to be able to understand it um but that doesn't mean that everybody that's actually implementing these things should have all of that knowledge it should be they should be able to identify what they want to try and achieve to do that so the how of doing this is depends entirely on what you're doing with the data. So uh, I want to look at a little bit, because you can, you can use data for different things, whether it's trying to build a prototype, which is a lot of kind of what I do in my work. Um, you're using the data to identify that the prototype's actually doing what you want it to do. Um, you can use it for inferring what the world looks like to you, or you can even use it for things like uh, uh, understanding optimizations and processes you have. So there's a lot of different reasons that you would do this and the how to achieve those things is it would depend on those things. And I also want to touch on the, the monsters that I have in this slide, which is dynamics. Um, because these are, these are the things that I think that people should think about when they're using data. Um, so this should identify what you are. Now, we went through the, uh, you all put in your answers, um, and I'm sure you're all interested in what the, I'm sure you're all interested in, in what the answer was to this. So out of, out of the five people, well, six people that answered, the, uh, the outcome was the actual value that we got as the mean was 9.7. So it was actually, there was somebody that guessed nine. So you've, you've managed to successfully win the, the first round of this. Uh, I hope you feel proud. The... Uh, so look, looking at the why, so the, well, no, this was the, sorry, this was the, the actual initial slide I was doing. Um, so you have gone through that already. Okay, so the why, the, I don't know if many people have used the strategizer or business model canvas for trying to kind of get their business plan together or try and understand things like that. So you'd look at, you kind of split it into kind of gains that you might be able to go or pains that you might be able to remove. Um, 
why you use data, I think kind of comes down to kind of what you're trying to do with it. So this comes down to that reporting. So if you're trying to use actually descriptive statistics, um, this goes into visualization. So you could, you could get the data, you could process it into some type of visualization. Now, this is helpful to try and make a case uh, for actually doing something <laughs> for, uh, for, for example, going through funding or stuff like that, you can actually use visualization to try and make a better case for it, or even just understanding it yourself. Like people kind of know that a picture can actually give you a lot more insight. Uh, and when we're trying to understand the underlying data on something, trying to do a visualization of it just gives us this picture of the data. I mean, we're, we're infinitely better at understanding patterns uh, as, as humans than, than machines. So if you're able to do that sort of processing, it can help you give insights um, into it. The, the outcomes then, I mean, in terms of like innovation, if you're trying to develop a new prototype, which is again, kind of what I do in my, in my lab, um, when we're testing an idea, you do something called user testing. So in that process, what you do is um, you'd have to be able to concretely say that the data you get from the user testing is actually giving you the outcome that you want. Um, and it isn't just you perceiving it as giving it. So it's it's a kind of validation of your own of your own guessing. It's that I'll go to hypothesis testing later on, which I think comes into that um, prediction. So so I mean, once you've actually can understand the data and you've actually said, okay, well, I can take this data and I can process it into this way. You can bring hypothetical scenarios, and then you can run like hypothetical data, so you can actually predict what the outcome of something might be. Um, this this is incredibly dependent upon dynamics because the the situation in the future may be affected by what's happening at the moment um so as things progress that actual model might become less and less useful uh in the future so that's one thing to think about in terms of prediction um optimization um this is something i did in my previous job so if you have a system you can if you're able to quantify like how how efficient it is, then you can maybe test optimizations to see if you can gain the efficiencies. Um, but to be able to do that, again, you need to make sure you're doing the, the, the getting the data from it and general monitoring of things. So you can, you can collect this data, to be able to understand how things are going, make sure things aren't changing, then be able to act on, on any changes to the environment you have. Um, the, so, I mean, it, broadly, I would say you might be able to split these sort of statistics into two kind of parts. So it would be the descriptive statistics. So this is about kind of the, the use of reports, um, diagrams, uh, graphs, and, and whatnot. Um, you can use this for kind of marketing. You can use this for, for trying to understand clarity. So the kind of things I did before. And then there's the inferential uh, use of statistics. So this is our data. This is being able to kind of understand problem solve. Um, so this is where you're actually kind of like either making decisions based on the data um, or trying to predict what might happen in the future so you can know how you want to adapt to it. Um, the feel free, I'm gonna say this again, feel free to pose questions in the Q&A if you have any, have any queries. If you think I need a little bit more clarification about what I'm saying, feel free to ask that as well. Um, I'll try and answer. If you, if you think of a question you might want to be at the end, then I'll, I'll try and come to those at the end, but, but feel free to kind of make comments or, or questions in there. Um, I did put this, seems awful early, but I did, I did come to this again. So, Maybe we should try this once more. So if people could actually type into the panelists um, your suggestions for your for your guesses, I'll uh, I'll try and run this run this experiment again, um, and then we'll see see what we get the second time. Uh, there's always one, isn't there? I know, I know you can't see the suggestions coming to the panelists, but um, I can just say you know who you are, Rob. Um, 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so let's see. Uh, I think that's everybody already. So let's see what happens this time. Okay. So we do have a, a winner. Um, it was 12.07. So uh, well done, Laura. <laughs> we all know who Rob is. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. There's, it's interesting, actually. What if for everybody who didn't do doesn't see that actually, what what Rob did in that one is he gave ninety nine as his number. Um, there's the I, you'll be surprised at how many times that happens when I've done this workshop, um, and I mean the, the what happens with that is that that it kind of obviously it skews because you're dealing with the mean. This like pulls the number incredibly high up. Um, it kind of ruins the effect, but given that Rob's done that, it means he understands the effect that's actually happening. <laughs> there is, the, yeah, there's always one. Um, so well done, Laura, uh, on the second one there. Um, let's see, I'll carry on through then. So this is, uh, this is actually from... Um, from an association meeting. This is the knowledge discovery and data mining is the, what the KDD stands for. Uh, and it's a kind of diagram around the type of, um, the kind of machine learning or it's, it's based on machine learning, but it's like, it's based around uh, using, using data. So you see these kind of areas. Um, so neural computing is really where you kind of develop um, your algorithms on patterns in the brain. So this is like replicating neurons to try and derive this learning systems. Um, now, AI there is kind of in that side of it, but I think AI is a lot, well, it is, it's a wider on the other side of there, but AI doesn't necessarily have to be, I think, incredibly smart. AI can just be like a bunch of rules that you've put together to try and understand the system. So, so like even a, even a, a control system that just looks at inputs and puts outputs. I, I think that's a kind a type of AI because it's it's really in, interpreting what's coming in and, and kind of producing an output. Um, so, but this this does split it into the, what I've kind of done is this statistics is like formal methods. So you have like statistical analysis that you can do on things, and, and people are familiar with kind of regression to the mean. Or I'll talk about hypothesis testing actually uh, a little bit in the moment. At, um, so this is. Uh, this is kind of a formal process of understanding and it's it's used in um creating diagrams or like if you if you create an average of something which is what we've just done in that experiment um it's kind of a form of doing the statistical analysis and what you're looking at um and those those things are done by specialists so like i think you you need a data scientist to come in to look at that that, that doesn't mean that machine learning doesn't need that but what the what the statistician will do is they'll have an understanding of the kind of biases and uses uses of these algorithms, uh, these types of uh, statistical methodology, and they'll be able to kind of identify where and where the, where they should be used and where they shouldn't be used. Now, in machine learning, there's a similar process. There's lots of different algorithms and models in machine learning, and you kind of need to know where they can be used and where they can't be used. Um, machine learning is basically you have you have a model which you feed in data and then it kind of derives its own type of analysis to do it. That's a very general explanation, but, but hopefully that kind of, that kind of makes, it, makes it clear. Now, their general purpose, and in, in the reason that their general purpose is that how you develop a machine learning algorithm is you, you give it a bunch of input and then you identify the outputs that you are looking for. So like if it's a video, for example, you go in and identify people in the video and then you feed all of that into the machine learning algorithm. So the algorithm learns from you identifying people in the machine in the in the algorithm, and then it gives the output. Now, one uh, one part about this that I'm going to say there is something that gets talked about is kind of bias uh, in these types of algorithms. Um, and I think it's I think it's very important to kind of point this out that if you if you as somebody who's identifying these things as the data set or as your identification identification in the data set um, has a bias there that will be embedded in the machine learning algorithm because it's not as in the statistical methods it's a formal process that you're actually looking at the machine learning algorithm will take whatever you're giving it and think that this is the way it should be um, so like for example like in America there was I saw there was a few people who worked in, in law in the chat so 
In the US, there is the, the situation where they, they're sentencing algorithms that they've been using to try and sentence people. And obviously, in the sentencing in the US, there's a disproportionate uh, sentencing on people of color in the US. And that has been embedded in these algorithms and then been repeated once they've actually been running these no sort of processes so like being able to understand those sorts of biases either in your data set or your understanding of them is something that i think needs to be highlighted and very much thought about when you're when you're developing anything like this um, um now i'm going to talk a talk about this randomness idea um because like what what we do as people is we're really good at identifying patterns. Like this is why I was saying like being able to look at a picture of something will help you uh, over like a bunch of data. Um, but what we're not very good at is at understanding the effect of randomness. Like that maybe there's there maybe the pattern that we're seeing isn't actually a pattern. Maybe it's just some effect of just randomness that we're actually being exposed to, and this then can come into the the kind of biases that we have. Um, we're able to use tools, and I think these tools should be these sort of data analysis processes, like either statistical or machine learning or anything like this. We should use these things, yeah? Now, the world that we're dealing with is a mess of randomness, yeah? There's just like lots of things going on. What we do is we build in systems into that. But when we're building those systems, we end up with this emergent behavior. So this is like unforeseen events from the things that we're doing, yeah? So we might be very good at identifying where those things are happening, but what the, what the data analysis can do is it can kind of like try and make sure that we're not seeing something that isn't there. Um, as an example of this, I'm, I am going to explain a little bit. I hope, I think people should understand what hypothesis testing is, but I do want to kind of approach it because I think that, that these types of tools are things that you should use in these cases. Um, it's kind of how do you how do you understand that this is not happening? So, like in this example, I'm using kind of a population. Um, I'm using a population and a sample. And the how hypothesis testing works is you have you have this image of how the world should be. So these two bell curves on the on the left hand side of the screen, the the black one I'm saying is is what we think the world is. So this is kind of this is what we think it is. So this is our hypothesis, null hypothesis, uh, it's zero. And then we've got, well, this is how we think that it, that it could be, or this is another example of we want to test to make sure it isn't the, the alternative hypothesis, which is the red one. Um, now, what we're wanting to do, we can't, in this example, we can't test the whole population, so we want to test the sample of the population. Now, if we tested the whole population, we could just derive the whole population as the bell curve, figure it out and see if it fits on either of these. But because we're just testing a small portion of it, and there could be other effects that are actually changing how this looks to us, um, we want to make sure that when we actually do this test, it's going to be under this one and not under this, uh, under the alternative hypothesis and not under null hypothesis. Um, it's not exactly what works, but a good way to think about it is we want to make sure that this sample population isn't just in the little gap overlap between the two of them. We want to make sure that it is actually something that shows us the wider um, effect of it. So this, this is kind of the process of using it. So if we, for example, identify something that we think we see in society and we want to test for it, we could use this as a means of interrogating the data that we have to basically understand that we are actually seeing this. And it isn't just some sort of random effect that's kind of reinforcing our viewpoint. Um, so it's a, it's a good example of where you're using our ability to, to identify patterns and data analysis ability to kind of identify where, like what this randomness is and, and how we are able to make sure that it isn't that that we're actually trying to achieve. Um, it's kind of, think of it kind of even as a check on our own biases or, our, or our, like, not that it can get rid of it, but maybe it's a check on our own kind of thinking that we know things and thinking that we actually understand these things when we want to make sure that it is actually something that, that is there. Um, there we go. So the, the, one of the things hopefully you've already seen, well, you, you'd already understand from the example, uh, the, the experiment that I'm doing, 
um, is that, that over time, depending on the system, uh, things change. So this is where this is where the split between kind of these static systems or dynamic systems come in. Um, a static system is, is, is something like a, a dice or a lever. I mean, dice is the prime example because it's where it kind of comes from. Um, it's actually kind of in mathematics, it's Pascal and Fermat who, who first started analyzing dice and, and how these roles would, would go over time. Um, static systems, the, the reason for them is that the previous uh, state of the system doesn't affect the future states of the system. So if you roll a dice once, it's the same. You roll it again, it's just a random between one and six. In a dynamic system, you have a feedback loop. Um, this actually can be exemplified by what's classed as an engine governor, which is something that controls the speed of an engine. Now, if you start ramping up an engine, it will keep on ramping up and it'll just start, it'll go until it explodes. What you need is a governor that watches that ramping up of the engine and then restricts how fast it's going. So you end up with this balance. Um, other things in the system can do this. And the example I think I want to give from our, our little experiment that we did was that the the when you play this game and i, I know that that uh, rob was being quite quite interesting with this but when you're playing this game if you're looking at the number and trying to guess the average of people's guesses you should actually kind of keep on going down um but obviously that doesn't always happen uh because people will people will try and do other things with it uh but that's that's kind of what that effect looks like that's how that interacts with the system now if you're developing some sort of data analysis and you're not repeating the data analysis or trying to look for yourself where that system might be moving, the, the outcomes of your data analysis is, is not going to be relevant in the future because you're dealing with a dynamic system. You're not dealing with a static system. Um, so this is, where, this is where it kind of comes into either like a, maybe optimization, maintenance, definitely. Um, you're looking at the changes of the system through time. Um, so using data for that sort of stuff is quite it's quite important. Um, I could, yeah, no, I could I could probably have one more try of the game. I think I'm a little bit ahead, so we'll we'll try this once more. If you all put in your numbers um, to the panelists, and then we'll we'll see if we can we can play this once more. Um, see if anybody else joins Rob. Uh, So there you are. Okay, there you are. Then again, oh wow. Okay, so this is this is an interesting one. You were all quite high on this one, actually. Um, so here we actually have three point five four on this. So we have a we have a we have a two winners. So both Nick and Manny won on that one. Um, but you see how how fast that's actually going down. I mean, everybody's kind of guessed a little bit high. The numbers ranged between between five and eleven on that one. I think was it five and eleven? No, five and ten. So we have that. Um, now, thinking about thinking about kind of what I've spoke about with these sort of looking at these systems and trying to understand it. Um, we work in Scotland, we work with an organization called Data Lab. Um, the, and they, they basically help businesses with this process. And, and the reason I'm saying this is because they've, they do a lot of kind of workshops on this. Um, and I've, I've been to a few of their, their events and, and things like this, and they've, they've got a really good way of looking at it. So they, they kind of split it up into kind of like the process of, of how you, how you do it, um, how you you how you approach using the data uh, in your business, the the so when I look at this, when I look at what I'm teaching in this from, from sort of that from that perspective, kind of it comes back to two kind of three stages where you're 
you're first kind of identifying that opportunity. So this, this definitely comes into your kind of, if you're doing your business model canvas, if you're identifying these pains and gains is identifying those. Um, you're trying to figure out the problem area. You're trying to figure out kind of the data that you either have available or data about, that you might want to have available to try and understand this. Think early as early as possible, whether you're dealing with something that, that does have these feedback loops or whether it's something that is kind of very much set. Um, then you actually need to do, do this sort of solution evaluation. Uh, you need to try and figure out what, what an actual, um, what success looks like. Yeah. What is it, what is it that you would like to see and where you'd look, where do you think, what do you think uh, an outcome that would actually prove to you this is going to be? Now, this, this comes into where you're trying to identify that alternative hypothesis. You use these statistical data to make sure that you're actually getting that. Um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with design-led thinking. Um, we also do a workshop on design-led thinking in Eagle Labs um, that's done by Anna, one of my one of the other engineers. Uh, so this is kind of design-led thinking is a process where you'd uh, you kind of open up what you're trying to do uh, through these stages of trying to bring in as much as possible, and then kind of narrowing down to the things that you think are pertinent and then try and again expand and bring in. So you're like, you're focusing on what you're trying to do, but you're trying to also at the same time figure out things around it. Um, I think that process is really useful in this because what it allows you to do is those things, when you start widening your viewpoint, you start seeing the things that could be having an effect on what you're doing. And you might be able to identify these kind of feedbacks or these things that'll, that'll actually cause this thing to change. Um, the and then at the end you've also got kind of the implementation aspect so if you're actually implementing a process with data uh once you kind of have it you you need to you need to make sure that that when you implement it you keep that process going and you keep on monitoring it um because if you're if you're looking at changing the way that you actually work from this data which a lot of it is through either innovation or some types of optimization um, you could end up having a knock-on effect to the system and you need to make sure that that effect doesn't have any kind of emergence or any kind of things that are actually a negative impact instead of a positive impact. So you should, you should keep this kind of monitoring going. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the data tools, I mean, I do the, the example, the test, the little experiment that I was going through with you, I was doing in a, in a Python notebook. Um, and, and Python Notebook has a, has a bunch of tools in there, which, which I use when I'm working. And um, what it allows you to do is kind of easily repeat these, these experiments on things or getting new data sets and trying them again. So this, this constant monitoring of kind of what you've done and until you're sure, until you're sure, then you can, you'd be able to kind of continue doing that. Um, that kind of brings me to the end of this now. So um, I don't know if I've not had any questions in the actual questions and answers, but I'm not sure if anybody has any any more questions that they'd like to that they'd like to pose. But I wonder, Kevin, if I might jump in just on on the last <laughs> point you've made yeah. there, because uh, I've got yeah. a, a question. Mm -hmm. I think it's really interesting. You're talking about iterative design and actually how we can be data driven and therefore actually look at what is the data telling us and therefore what's the implication on our business. Mm. How I wonder if a concern there might be, um, you know, that there's still quite a lot of practice that says we build it, we do it once and we deliver it. How mm -hmm. would you um, sort of get buy-in in that implementation sort of stage um, an acceptance sort of within an organization that actually you're going to, the data is going to inform and it might change actually what that implementation looks like. Um, so it's um, sort of not a one, a one shot. Yeah. If you, I, I mean, Okay, I mean this. This comes from this probably comes from a little bit from my working experience. Um, um, I was on some larger projects uh, developing um, or, or either refurbishing or, or doing things with control systems. And but the the if you're if you're asking specifically about buy-in, um, if you look at a, a design-led thinking process where you're you're in that expansion stage and you're trying to understand things bring the people that are going to be affected by this directly into that process and have them have the, the say in how that process goes ahead and maybe try and involve them in it more. Um, because if, if people 
are involved in something and see that that they're actually influencing and being able to kind of drive the outcomes and make sure that the concerns that they have are actually being addressed, um, or even that the, the the suggestions that they come with are being implemented. That's I think that's an amazingly powerful sort of buy-in um, in that process. So, like, I don't know, I don't know how much other areas would use sort of a de- design-led thinking methodology and, and these sort of things, but but I definitely think, like, in my example, uh, if I was doing, for example, an interface for a control system for an operator, um, I would first just draw on paper as a as an interface, and I would bring the operator directly into that process and basically ask him to do the things that he was doing and watch what he was doing and talk to him and get suggestions. And at that, in that process, he's saying, oh, I don't like this. This is the way it is. And I'll go, okay, that's, that's fine. And I'll change it around. And it's very much developed for the end person that's either going to be using it or the person that's actually going to be either implementing or, or involved with it at that point. I guess that would be, that would be the main way I do it. Is that, is that, is that reasonable? Is that? Mm, fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have any other questions from anybody either into the Q&A or into the chat? I, I did see a chat, if I feel free to, for other people to ask, I, I did see a chat there about Rob talking about kind of ignoring outliers or comedians in the future. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's an interesting one because I, I actually studied economics um, and a lot of that is to do with kind of statistical analysis. And you talk about a lot of this regression um, to the mean. So these, this process um, when you're doing this and in it, you talk about outliers. Um, where you see these things, and, and a lot of the times they're they're kind of ignored uh, and they're kind of brushed aside as being, oh, this is something that isn't, it shouldn't be in our model because it isn't representative. And I, the, that fits kind of uneasily with me for the reason that you need to kind of look at why why the person's doing it and what's actually happening there. Because, I mean, if my if my if the outcome that that experiment that I did has no outcome, like it, it's not used really for anything, there's not really a d- d- designable outcome. But if you are actually, if you thought about it in a process where you're trying to use this as a group of people with everybody putting in their inputs, and people are doing that in that process, you then maybe want to think about like, well, why are they doing that? Like maybe it's not an outlier, maybe it's something that's actually quite significant that we want to look at and actually and actually take note of. And that's something that data analysis and statistics would be completely incapable of doing because it would very much have to look. And I I like the idea that you said comedian there as well, because it might have to look at the social relationships with people, what they're actually trying to achieve, like what what they're trying to do. So it's an it's an interesting thing to question. And it's an interesting way to look at it from from the perspective of you as a as a human and, and person trying to interact with these and understand better the systems that you're looking at. So yeah, I, get, I don't know if that answers that question, but we need more comedians though. I could say that much. <laughs> Excellent, wonderful. Excellent. Uh, any final questions coming through? Mm-hmm. Just checking. It's quite early in that. I've rushed through, I'd say usually, usually I've, I've, I've done these a lot more when I've seen people. Um, and I try and get a lot more interaction um, during it. So, so I'll actually kind of like ask people questions. So I think I've managed to go through it quite quickly just because I haven't had that, that in here. But, um, but thank you all very much for listening. And I guess if you do have any more questions that you want afterwards, feel free to get in touch with me. Um, I'm always, I'm always uh, open for, for any sort of things like this. Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Kevin. Um, we okay. will be sharing um, the presentation and the information mm-hmm. through to everybody who's attended today. Um, okay. And obviously, uh, as we just said, if you if you have any further questions, if you'd like to be put in touch, please do let us know. Do. Um, so thank you very much. We do have um, another uh, eight, I think, um, events running wow. for this week um, for Data Driven Guernsey Week. So please do pop along to the Digital Greenhouse website to take a look if you haven't signed up. Um, there are lots of other events happening, um, fantastic ones around, around data um, and this topic as well. So thank you very much, Kevin, and thank you for everyone attending today.